today we'll be discussing some topics in physics. So I think most of you have an idea about which topic we are going to uh, discuss today. So today we'll be discussing about lasers and quantum mechanics. So I think you will have an idea about what is lasers. Maybe you have studied something uh, related to lasers in your uh, school or you heard the term and you are very much familiar with what is a laser. So the next topic is quantum mechanics or quantum computing. So why I have chosen this topic is I'll, I'll give you an idea. For each student who goes into this course called engineering, maybe in uh, any college, I think, so we'll be teaching or you'll have some subjects or you'll have some chapters which is related to this laser and quantum computing. So that's why I have chosen this topic for your class. So it's just, I, I wish to give you some basic idea related to the lasers and the quantum computing. So that's the reason today we are going to discuss about lasers and quantum computing. So let's start with laser. So what is laser? Everyone know what is a laser? What is it? It's the light amplification by Simulated emission of radiation. So we know what is the acronym for the laser, for the term laser. So the working of the laser is similar to what is defined in the term. It's the light amplification by the stimulated emission of the radiation. So what can be called as the lasers? So lasers are the light beams that are powerful enough to travel mi miles through the sky and can cut lumps of metals. So we understood that they are very powerful beams of light or they're very powerful light beams. They can travel uh, to long distances and they, they, they can cut the metals. So this is one of the function of the lasers also. So the output of a laser is a coherent electromagnetic field. So you know what is an electromagnetic field? We have seen it, right? Electromagnetic waves, what are their applications? We have an idea about it. So in a coherent beam of electromagnetic energy, almost all the waves will have the same frequency and the same phase. So while discussing electromagnetic waves, we have discussed about what is phase and what is frequency. So for the coherent beam of electromagnetic energy, all the, uh, all, all the waves are having the fre same frequency, almost the same frequency and the phase. So we can call the laser as a coherent electromagnetic field. Or I'll, I'll give you some more idea. So laser is a device um, which can maybe stimulate some atoms or molecules and they'll emit the light of a particular wavelength. So this can be also called as a laser which stimulates or due to some reaction, they are going to emit light. So we'll see the working of laser in very detail today. So I have included that. So yeah, you have seen these types, right? There are more types of lasers. So we have the semiconductor lasers, we have solid state lasers, we have the uh, liquid that dye lasers are there, then gas type lasers are there. So we have different category of lasers. So these name indicates the media which is being used. So based on the type of the medium, the lasers are classified into different category. So these semiconductor lasers can be found in some of the uh, several or different type of the electronic devices. They, are, they can be used in some devices like maybe printers or some scanners and all. So it's the diode type of lasers. It's the semiconductor diode lasers. And there are solid state lasers. So what is mean by the solid state la laser? So their medium will be a solid. So the, they are made up of a solid medium. I'll give you some uh, example. It is made of maybe some ruby or some crystalline type of materials. Maybe some of students have heard about the YAG, yttrium aluminum garnet. So it's a combination. So all these can be some type of solids. So this is the combination or the solid state lasers are made of them. So these type of lasers, solid state or this category of lasers are mainly used in military or maybe uh, 
to drill some of the metals. In these applications, we use this solid state lasers. Then we have this liquid dye lasers and then gas lasers. So liquid dye lasers have a medium as liquid, have the medium as liquid and the uh, gas lasers, they have the medium as gases. Maybe nitrogen or maybe carbon dioxide or maybe argon. So all these can be some of the combination. And these gas lasers are mostly used in the industrial purposes or industry needs to meet the industry needs. There are also different categories of lasers like maybe chemical lasers are one among them. So these are the most common type of lasers. Okay. Now, we could study about the working of a laser. So I know you have seen or you have watched all these movies, right? So in that Star Wars or in Iron Man, we can see like how, how a laser will look like or what, what it is being. They have compressed uh, or he has compressed a particular uh, type of energy in his arm and forms it with, you have seen these movies. So in all the science fiction, we have this concept of lasers being used. So now we'll move into the working. So I have given a diagram here. So in this diagram, we can see an active medium, a laser cavity. We can see an output beam. That output beam is our laser. Then there is reflector. So we have here the total and the partial reflector. So these are the most important, three important parts in this working of the laser. So the first one is gain medium or crystal. The second one is an energy source and the third one is optical resonators. So these three constitute a laser. So we'll, we'll move into the working of the laser. So a laser is having a chamber or we can call this as a cavity. From this cavity, we'll reflect these different types, like which is defined to reflect the different types of radiations, like maybe infrared or visible or ultraviolet types of radiation. So this is the basic step. We are having a cavity and from this cavity or we'll have a chamber and we can call this as cavity also. And from this, uh, it is used to internally reflect these type of radiations, like maybe ultraviolet or visible or the infrared radiation. And one more thing is the cavity can contain maybe either liquids or gas or solids. So the selection of the cavity, if we are having solid, the output will be of some particular wavelength. If we are having this as liquid, the output will be of some another wavelength. And if you have this as gases, the wavelength changes. The output wavelength will depend on the material we are having in this cavity. It can be of any three, like solids, liquids, or can be fluids maybe liquids okay then you can see two mirrors here it's like a total reflector is there and a partial reflector is there so at the two ends we are having this cavities so i'll tell you one mirror is totally reflecting and the other is partially reflected so it means it will allow uh, the total reflector mirror will not allow any energy to pass through and the partial reflector mirror will allow some portion of the energy to pass through it. So here the working of this is we have this pumping mechanism or we have this pump. So this pump will uh, send out some energy or um, some external energy into this, into this active medium. So as a result of this process of the pumping here, an electromagnetic field will appear inside this cavity. So then this electromagnetic field between these mirrors got reflected. So as a repetition of this, we'll have this beams produced inside. So this is the working. So once we have this beam, we have this partial reflector, which allows some portion of the beam to get out of this, uh, maybe circuit, or we can call this get out of this setup. So that is what we call as the lasers. So I think you have some idea or you received some idea about the working of what we call this as laser. So we are having a chamber or we are having a cavity which is designed to reflect the radiation. And in that cavity or in that chamber, we'll have the different types of materials. So based on the material, the wavelength of the output diverse, uh, differs. And at the two ends, we have the mirrors. One mirror is fully reflective and the other is partially reflective. 
So we have to introduce some energy for that. We have the mechanism called the pumping. So it's an external source or we provide this. Uh, so in order to start the process to get activated, we have this external pumping. So once the pumping is done and some field gets produced, which is inside this cavity, And then the waves will reflect through these mirrors and some portion gets out from this mirror. So this is what we can call as laser. There are a lot more steps in the working. So I have just given a simple idea, just given a brief about the working of lasers. Okay. So now I'll, I'll give you some detailed idea about the working principle of laser. So this is very, very important. You have to have an idea about all the steps. Mostly we'll call this as four steps. So I have given the diagram which represents in detail what is happening in each stage. So the first step we can call this as absorption of radiation or light. So you know about the states called the ground state and excited state. I know you are preparing for this DA examination. So you have all these formulas with you. You have done problems with this E1, E2 states and all. So I'm not going into detail in that. So I'll, I'll just give you a brief idea. So the first step is absorption of radiation or light. So here we are providing some external energy or something to get this process activated. So due to that energy, we are here you can see in the diagram, we have this photon here. So here I have this uh, in the lower energy state. So once the photon is there, so uh, the electrons in the ground state absorbs that energy from this photon and it jumps to the higher energy state. So this is the first part called the absorption. So the first step in the laser, working of laser is absorption. And here I have the photon which uh, comes and meets this electron. So it gets activated and it moves to the higher energy state. So it can, you know what is lifetime, right? So the time period with which it retains there or it, it remains there in the higher energy state is what is called the lifetime. So here, uh, instead of this photon, maybe we can use some heat or some electric field or we can even provide light to get this activated. And you have an idea about the two energy levels. We call this lower energy state as E1 and this higher energy state as the E2. So this is the lower energy state electrons and this is the higher energy state electrons. So how the photon or how much effective or how much energy this photon has to have. It is the difference between these two. It is E2 minus E1. This we have studied in our classes. When the photon or the light of energy, which is equal to the difference between the two energy levels, that is the higher energy state and the lower energy state is given to the lower energy state electron, then they will jump to the higher energy state. So then it goes to the higher energy state. Uh, the main idea is that it remains there for its lifetime. And after that, it comes back to the lower energy state. So this is the first step of absorption of radiation of light. Now we'll move to the second step, which is called as the spontaneous emission. So here we have the electrons at the higher energy state. So they'll return to the ground state by emitting some photon. That is what is called the spontaneous emission. So from the higher energy state, they have emitted this photon and they moves into the lower energy state. So this is what we call the spontaneous emission. So this is done by uh, means after the lifetime is completed. I know you have an idea or you used to have this number in your problems, like the lifetime of an electron. It is uh, the lifetime of an electron in the excited state is 10 raised to minus eight seconds. So once the lifetime is completed, it releases some energy and it comes back to the lower energy state. This is something which occurs naturally and we call this as spontaneous emission. Now the next step is, I'll, I'll tell you, this is what we call as stimulated emission. So stimulated emission, emission is not natural. This is something which we are creating. So here uh, in the previous stage, if it is like I'm having an electron in the higher energy state E2, what I'll do is I'll, I'll excite that electron by using a proton or maybe some energy. Most probably we are doing this by using a proton. So we'll excite it and what, what it will do. So this will have more energy than it should have. So it will 
emit two protons and then they sorry it will emit two photons and then they'll come to the lower energy state so this is the stimulated emission which is artificial and which we are performing so we are forcefully returning the excited electron to the ground state it's like this electron will not complete its lifetime in this higher energy state we'll just excite it and then they limit the two photons and they'll come to the lower energy state so this is what we call as the process called the stimulated emission now we have one more step i'll, I'll tell you it's the populated inversion i i don't know how many of you will get this idea so i'll give you uh, it's a three level laser so there are different levels or different types of lasers it's i am explaining something related to the three level laser so i have one diagram in front of me just have a look at it so you have this energy levels e1 e2 e3 so from the diagram itself you can have an understanding that e1 is the lower level and e2 is the middle level or this we can call this as meta levels right so then e3 is the another level so here we have this electrons in the e1 level we are exciting it with some photons and we they will move to the e3 level so it's like we are exciting it with the difference like e3 minus e1 so once they are in the upper level they'll i'm sorry uh, oh i'm sorry okay so once they are in the upper level they will uh, they their lifetime is very low so they'll activate some or they'll emit some non radiative emission and they'll go to the level called the e2 so that is the second excited level so now what we'll do is actually what will happen is from the second excited level they'll emit one photon and they'll move to the lower level but what we are going to do is this emitted photon or this non radiative emitted photon will uh, activate or will activate it with the energy level 2 then what will happen the stimulated emission we have already seen in the previous slide this e2 energy level will emit two photons and they will come back to the e3 so this is a whole procedure these four steps combine the working of a laser so i think i have given or i have talked about it in much detail so just have an idea about the names of the processes or what is happening in each process so those students who wish to know more about these or who want to know more in detail they can contact me or, and maybe i'll i'll share my slides also okay so see the video i think uh, after this video itself you you have some idea about how this is working so now we'll quickly move on to some other portions of the laser so what are the characteristics of laser i think you have studied this right so coherence directivity monochromatism high output diffusibility brightness or directionality intensity all this can be called as the characteristics of laser so we'll have a quick idea about each one of them so the first one is monochromatism so what do you mean by this monochromatism so which means the light emitted by the laser all the beams will have the same wavelength or they will have one color that is the property called the monochromatism so now the second one is directivity which means these lasers or the beams are focused in one particular direction then the next one is what called as coherence so what do you mean by coherence so all the photons emitted will have the same wavelength and the frequency and this we call as the coherence then brightness or uh, maybe diffusibility all these can be some characters of the laser 
So I think you have an idea about what the concept of laser is. Now we will move on to the part called what are the uses of lasers or where these lasers are being used. So mainly we know the term like we use this for entertainment and all. So this is being used in different fields. So I'll, I'll tell you like uh, once the laser or uh, once in earlier time or when the first time this laser was invented, most of the scientists told like lasers can be called as a solution looking for a problem. So it's, it may feel funny or it's like a solution which is looking for a problem. So there has to be a problem and laser is a solution for that. So to some extent, the working of the laser was like that or it proved it as true. So the special or the specific nature and the characteristics of laser, which made it useful for in different areas. It is being used in research, maybe in some consumer products, in telecommunication, the engineering, it is being a major part in medical sector. All these areas, this is being used. So let's see the uses of laser one by one. So we have mentioned some five areas here. So the first one is it's being used in tools. It's being used in the communication sector by defense and those organizations or those sectors. It's being used by the medical field and we know entertainment field also uses lasers. So let's discuss something about the tools. So there are laser cutting tools, right? You have heard about it, laser cutting. So mostly this is done by carbon dioxide lasers. So it's like they'll have a focus length and uh, through that focus, focus length, we'll pass the CO2 laser beam on the particular material surface. Which material is to be, uh, which material has to be cut, we'll pass it to, on the particular surface. So I'll, I'll tell you some advantages compared to the other type of methods. Here, there is no pollution. It's clean and safe. And the cutting speed is really high and we, we are not even touching the surface. So it's like the laser beam which is touching. So it's actually non-pollutant and it's clean and it's safe. And the speed of this operation is also really high. So this is mostly use, used in the industries. Maybe engineering industry or maybe in shipbuilding and all these they use this. And some robot cutting mechanisms. I'll, I'll give you some examples. There are 3D laser cutting mechanisms also. So it will it will create a model uh, by doing this process called the laser cutting. So the main advantages of the process of laser cutting, we can tell it uh, the fabric will not be pressurized or there will not, not be any external uh, pressure or any external force or any external disturbance that will be happening in the fabric. And the edges will be smooth and the cutting will be perfect. There will not be any issues. And I'll tell you uh, one more example. Uh, we used to cut our fabrics, like some of our clothes, in these clothing shops and all these uses some type of lasers. That's another application. Then in medicine, we know mostly for this eye-related uh, surgeries, right? Eye correction surgeries, we use the lasers. And there are different applications in this medical field, like maybe for treating of tumors and all, we use the laser. Then defense, we know defense or military, that field they use uh, in their weapons and uh, for their safety and all purposes, they are using this lasers also. So now we'll see each and every field in detail. I have given details of some of the fields. So let's see it. So the first one is laser in medicine. So it's like every field is making use of what we call as lasers, but the uh, real advantage is for the medical sector. So with the coming of lasers, the medical sector has advanced a lot. So I'll, I'll quickly read up some of the advantages or some of the uses of lasers in the medical sector. We have heard some terms like it is being mostly used by the department called the cosmetic dermatology. So the skin treating of all the skin things. So for the scar revision, skin resurfacing, laser hair removal, the tattoo removal, all these areas we need the laser. Then melanoma, we can call it as a skin cancer type of thing. So in dermatology, these lasers are being used to treat this melanoma situation also. Then there are some procedures, some words will be new to you, right? like phrenectomy, lithotroph lithotrophy, all these will be new words to you. So phrenectomy is something which is related to the tissues and uh, 
lithotro lithotrophy is used to uh, it's mainly used for this kidney stones for the treatment of the kidney stones then you know what is mammography so this is lasers are being used in the mammography some of the medical imaging techniques then angioplasty we know the heart surgery so all these we are using laser then cancer diagnosis cancer treatments and even uh, for treating in the dentistry area also they use the lasers so in the particular field called me medicine there are different branches and every branch is making use of the concept or the idea of what we call as laser So now the uh, next part is it is being used in military applications. So it was mostly started by the U.S. military. The U.S. military was the first uh, state which started to use this uh, lasers or the weapons they have designed using this lasers. So it's like. Uh, what feature of this laser makes it more useful in this military applications? So the main feature we can call this as the probability of interception. It's like we can't disturb it or the it's very difficult to disturb a laser signal. So the probability of intercepting or interception of a laser signal is very low. The reason is that it has narrow beam divergence and the coherent optical mechanism. So these two features makes it useful for the sector called the military or the defense of those applications. I have uh, here some of the images. I think you are able to see those images and you can see what, what will be the applications. So similar to something we have seen in the science fiction movies, everything is now becoming reality. So what we have seen in this movies is now becoming reality so maybe for shooting some planes maybe in some blasting or in every area we are using this lasers it can be used to track the path of the missiles maybe drones uavs or maybe some fighter aircraft or fighter planes we use to track them so for each example i have listed something i have given some diagrams so what is the other efficiency or what makes this lasers used in this field so it is highly powerful. And the next important point is it is lightweighted. And one more thing is it is really cost effective. So it, it is really, uh, that's why this is being used in the air areas. So it's very cost effective for the uh, treating the airborne threats which are coming from different areas. So the now, now the next point is uh, the advancements in space operation and laser technology have offered a lot of possibilities of using lasers. So maybe in space also we are using this, maybe to calculate the distance and all those things. So during military operations in space also we'll be using the concept called the lasers. So one field which makes use of this laser in all way is the military field. So now we can see some other applications. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so just a minute. Uh, yeah, we were here, I think. Yeah. Okay. So let's see the other field. So after military, we are using mostly this thing in the industry. Many industrial, industrial applications are there for them. So all those mechanical engineers try to focus on this slide very carefully because you will be dealing with or you will be practically doing all these things in your laboratory, maybe in your second year or maybe in your third year. All those uh, ones who are interested in the mechanical or maybe uh, like automotive or automobile engineers. So lasers can be used in laser welding, drilling, cutting and marking. So all these are some of the areas where the lasers are being used. So in laser welding, what we are doing is this optical radiation or this laser is used to melt the material up to a particular depth. So that is what is done in the laser welding. Now the next is laser drilling. So in the case of laser drilling, 
we are removing the material by the process called the vaporization. So in laser drilling, we need the laser to be much more focused than that of the welding. So in, in drilling process, we need the intensity to be high. Then only the length will be uh, calculated here correctly. So the intensity of the beam to be high in the case of laser drilling. So now the next is laser cutting. So it's just used to cut the uh, some materials, maybe metals or something. So we can use this to cut those materials which are having low thermal conductivity. Then the next procedure is laser marking. You can see this in the diagram shown here. So this is some mark which is being made in the surface of a metal. So the laser marking is based on the local surface eval evaporation. This is the technique being used for the process called the local surface evaporation. So what is being used is we, we use to embed these barcodes there. Maybe some uh, serial numbers or maybe some logos and all we use to embed this using the technique called the laser marking. Maybe some of you have uh, seen this also in the uh, metals like steel or maybe polymers, maybe rubbers also we use this thing. So now we'll move on to the next set of, or the next category of applications. Yeah, so I have uh, mentioned here some of the pictures. You can have an uh, idea about all of them. So this is being used in different other fields also. Lasers are being used in garment industry. We have already discussed that. It is being used in communication sectors. It is being used in laser printing. Maybe barcode scanners also use this. Then heat treatment, optical disc, laser cooling. Uh, this is being used in LIDARs also. I know all of you have an idea about what is LIDAR. It is the light detection remote sensing method. Then in surveying also, there are the lasers is having some applications. So it's like laser plays a very important role in our daily life. Maybe if you're going to a shop it, itself, they are making use of this lasers. So now I think you have some clear idea about what is, being, uh, what is laser and what are the applications of laser. Now we will quickly move on to the topic called the quantum computing. So this is a uh, very important topic or this topic is really important nowadays or this topic is gaining a lot of importance nowadays. So I have to talk a lot regarding the quantum computing. So what is the definition of quantum computing? So I know you have not studied the, uh, this topic till now. So I'll, I'll, I'll make this as simpler as possible. So the quantum computing mainly focuses on, on the principles of quantum theory. So I'll tell you quantum theory is something which deals with the modern physics, maybe uh, the behavior of uh, some matter or behavior of or the energy at atomic or the subatomic levels. So the quantum theory deals with the modern physics, which explains the behavior of uh, some matter or some the which explains the behavior of some energy at an atomic or the subatomic level. So that is the definition of quantum computing. So we can say that uh, by the coming of quantum computing or with quantum computing, the field that has uh, that has got much advantage is the field of computer science or the computer technology. So quantum computing can be called as a type of computation or a process which comprises of some states. I think you have heard about the word called the superposition or interference or entanglement. So all these are some of the terms which are related to the process called the quantum computing. So it's a collective process of the superposition, interference, and entanglement. So the main idea behind quantum computing is, I'll, I'll give you the clear idea, it's to perform some calculations or some computation. Computation itself means the calculation. So this quantum computing mainly focuses on doing some calculation. So those devices which perform these calculations or the quantum computations can be called as the quantum computers. Those devices which perform the quantum computing, there are quantum computers. Uh, it's not like the same task that that is what our computers are now doing. It's not the ordinary computers. They are doing something special. So I'll, I'll give you some idea about all these things. So in actually in the computers we are using or in the systems we are using, uh, how we'll represent data? 
you all know in systems we represent the data using base either zero or one right so in the case of quantum computing we have this q bits so these q bits are the bits which is used to represent the data or quantum computing uses these quantum bits which these q bits can be called as the quantum bits so this represents a part of memory or a unit of memory and these q bits can be have a two state quantum mechanical system i'll i'll give you the details uh, so the q states are this is being this quantum mechanics works with the bit or the data called the q bits or the quantum bits and it is comprised of the two state quantum mechanical system so now let's see some detail so the quantum mechanics is a combination of some of the principles like superposition and entanglement or the quantum computing as a combination of the principles like superposition and entanglement so what is mean by superposition so superposition is called as a principle which states that we do not know the state of an object at a given time it is possible that a an object can be in maybe one or more states simultaneously so we'll know about which state the object is when we look into it so that is what called the principle of superposition till now we have heard about yeah a statement can be either true or false or it can be either yes or no when someone is asking us a question we'll have only one answer for the question either yes or no or either true or false but superposition is something beyond that so the superposition principle states that an object can be at a given point of time an object can be in more than one state or maybe in all states or maybe in two states and we'll come to know about it at which state when we look into it at which state the object is we'll come to have an idea about it when we look into it so this is what is called the superposition so i'll give you some example then you will get a clear idea so the second one is entanglement so by which method the energy and mass is uh, going to interact with each other or how they are going to correlate with each other this is what is called the entanglement so this is these two principles that is the entanglement and the superposition are extremely important in this computing and the communication okay so the superposition principle and this entanglement is extremely important in this computing and the communications and they they'll benefit us in numerous ways so just try to have an idea about what is quantum quantum computing is it it works on the principle of superposition and entanglement superposition means at a particular point of time an object can be in more than one state it's not true or false there are more states than that and we'll come to know about the state when we look into it and the next is entanglement it's the way in which these energy and masses are interacting or how they are interacting that is what we call the entanglement so now this is an interesting fact so i think by this example everyone have have an idea about what this is so this concept is what we call as the schrodinger's cat actually i i think you have heard about someone called the copenhagen so he was the one who did the previous interpretation of the superposition and the entanglement and schrodinger is also one scientist you have heard about maybe schrodinger's wave equation and all i i am not sure about that fact so schrodinger is a person who has uh, or who have come up with some idea or some example or who has to it's like he has explained the principle which was given by the copenhagen into another level or he has given it the explanation into another level or maybe some macroscopic level it's like we will be able to better understand it using this schrodinger's cat so this is really a famous example it's not an uh, practical experiment it's just a conceptual experiment to know the or to have an idea about what is the principle called the superposition so here in this diagram i have a cat in the box so i'll give you what is the experiment so i it's a conceptual experiment it's not a practical one so be alert it's just to give you a more idea about what is the principle called the superposition so i'm having a cat i have a steel chamber or a steel box and i have kept the cat in the steel chamber and i have some counter called giger counter so okay i have some counter that is okay now what i'll do is i'll take some bit of radioactive substance and maybe i'll i'll take some poison also maybe some gas or some high, uh, acid or something 
So I'll have some radioactive substance and uh, I'll I'll put this in the same steel chamber where the cat is kept and also the acid substance also I'll put it in the chamber and I'll close the chamber. Okay. So the concept is that maybe after one hour or two hours, the radioactive substance will get decay. So once the radioactive substance will get decay, the vessel which is having this poisonous gas will explode or uh, it will break and the cat will die. So this is the situation or this is the example which was given by the Schrodinger. So we have a chamber, we, we put one cat inside that and then we have a radioactive substances in a small portion, uh, small bottle or something and we have some acid in that, acid in another bottle. So we'll keep this acid and this uh, radioactive substance along with this cap and we'll close the chamber. Now we are not going to open the chamber. Now we are not going to open the chamber. I have closed it. So then what will be the result? So this will give you some idea about what was superposition. Oh, sorry. Okay. So if the radioactive element is going to decay maybe after one hour or two hours, the poisonous gas will explode and the cat will die. So that is the first case. There may be a chance or there may be a probability, maybe 50-50, that the radioactive element may not decay. So then what will happen? The cat will be alive. So I have to go and open this container. Then only I'll come to know about whether the cat is dead or cat is alive, right? So there are two options or two probability. So this you can relate with the concept called the superposition. In superposition, we told like we'll have two states. It's not like true or false. We'll have two or more than two states. Or there may be two or more than two states. But we'll come to know about it when we are going to check this. The same thing as what here mentioned in this Schrodinger's cat also, in this experiment also. So we can't actually find out whether the cat is dead or alive. So we have to open this chamber and then we'll understand whether the cat is dead or alive. So that is the concept being used here. So as long as the door is closed, the cat can be in two states. So this is what the Schrodinger's cat experiment is or the concept means. I think you have an idea and you can relate this to superposition. So now you can uh, see Imagine a video. that you take a cat and put it in a box. Also in the box, you put a small lump of radioactive material and a file of poison gas. There is an exactly 50-50 chance that an atom in the radioactive lump will decay and emit an electron. If it does decay, then it releases the gas and kills the cat. If it doesn't, the cat lives 50-50. The point is, there's a rather extraordinary consequence. Until you do open the box, the cat exists in an indeterminate state. The possibility that it is alive and the possibility that it is dead are two different waveforms superimposed on each other inside the box. Schrodinger put forward this idea to show the absurdity of quantum theory. So I think now you have an idea about the superposition principle. So this is just a concept or it was a teaching tool uh, adopted by maybe Schrodinger. Um, and he was, he was pointing out the absurdities which was given by the concept called the superposition. Now we'll come to something related to the real example. So when the classical computers or the computers we are using, they have only these two states, zeros or one. But according to this quantum computers, which operates according to the law of physics, they can have the more than one state. So it's like the information there can be processed as ones and zeros or one and zero simultaneously. So there are two options at a time that is one or zero. So how the combination of data will be? It will be zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So we are having more than one option at a particular point. So this is what that uh, CAT experiment used to tell us. So here, this is because of the quantum computers or this is what is happening in the quantum computer and the base of this is the Schrodinger's, uh, the base of this is the superposition which was explained by that experiment. So here we'll be representing the objects in maybe ones and zeros or one and zero. So there are different options. So we have the four option, either it can be zero, 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 one, one, zero or one, one. So all these four possibilities are there in the case of the quantum superposition state. 
So for a quantum superposition state, all these four possible states can exist. So sorry, can exist at the same time or can exist simultaneously. So this is one concept or one important uh, concept of the what is called as the quantum computing. So here we are going to deal with lots of lots and lots of data than the actual computers or than the computers which we are using nowadays. So here we will deal with the more amount of data. Okay. So now the next question is, you all know now we have the supercomputers and we are using the supercomputers, right? So by the year 2035, it is given that we'll have huge quantity of data. So you all have maybe Facebook account or maybe your Twitter account, all these accounts, all these social media accounts are there. So you all have posted photos, you all have posted videos, you all have so many contents there. So the companies, maybe data processing companies like maybe Google, Facebook or Amazon, all of them have the huge amount of data with them. Will the supercomputers be enough to run this data or are they okay or they, they'll be able to, will they be able to do this processing? So I'll tell you these supercomputers which run on thousands of classical processors or there are many processors which are running in parallel to solve the different sections of problem. Or it's not a single problem, they, they'll solve the problem from different parts. They'll have different types of problem and they'll solve them from different parts. But the disadvantage of the supercomputers is that when the data is high or uh, it will not be able to cop up that much or when the power consumption is high. So here we have mentioned the typical power consumption. It is 15 to 20 megawatts. Supercomputers are also limited or they, they are having their own limit. So here you can see a graph like um, system performance and the power. So for the IoT and all those things, it is the low power. Then for this mobile, we have some increased performance and something. Then it goes like the performance is increasing or the power consumption is also increasing. So as an alternative, or if the supercomputers were not able to deal with all these things, we have something called the quantum computers, or this is the reason we need the quantum computers. The supercomputers are managing everything in parallel, but their power consumption and they are having some issues. Their power consumption is very high and they'll not be able to deal with larger quantity of data. To some extent they can deal, but after that, in this superposition principle, you have already seen the states. It's like not two states or something. There are simultaneously having four or five states. So think about the different probabilities or different chances. So for this, we need the process called the, or we need the systems called the quantum computers. So until now we have relied on supercomputers to solve most of the problems. And we can call them as a large classical computers. They have thousands of CPUs or the graphical processing units embedded in it. So, but when the problem becomes larger, supercomputers are, aren't sufficient to solve the type of problems. That's the reason we need this concept or we need the systems called the quantum computers. So I think now you have an idea about why we need quantum computing or why this quantum computers are important. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one more example. So it's like you're going to a dinner party and you have so many people with you. So if I'm uh, having some dining table, sir, you can think about the different combinations, right? How many different combinations can be there? If I'm, if we are going or we two are going, it's like two combinations. If five people are going, it's five factorial, that is 120 combination. If 10 people are going together, it's think about the combination. So the number of combination is really high or the number of combination is really increasing so when this increase it, it it will be difficult or it will take some time for the supercomputers to evaluate these category so that's the reason we need these quantum computers so now i'll, I'll give you some examples or some application areas or some areas which will make use of the principle called the quantum computing or the quantum computers so machine learning super catalyst design medicine chemistry climate change Maybe earth science, battery chemistry, material science, engineering, artificial intelligence, information security, 
biomimetics it's a combination of mathematics chemistry and also physics then energy photovoltaics financial services supply chain and logistics so all these areas can have some improvement when we have the principle of quantum computing with us or the, when we have the concept of quantum computers with us now i'll quickly tell you some classifications of the quantum computers so we have this quantum inhaler this is the first category so it's actually the uh, somewhat same as the traditional computers they are they are restricted ones so the next category is analog quantum so this is somewhat the computational capacity is somewhat high compared to the actual computers or the computers we are using and the next category of computers is the universal quantum so in these universal quantum computers the computational power is really really high so these are the three different categories of the quantum computers so now have a look at the diagram so this was one which comes in i i think times new york i i don't remember which one is it's actually a paper cutting so the director of ibm research he is standing in front of an ibm q system it's a quantum computer there you can see it so the thing is that it is actually sealed or it is in a tunnel it is covered with the black glass i'll tell you we need to keep this really really cool and also we need to avoid the uh, outside noises or outside interferences because it can get the atoms and all those things affected so this is one initial model of the quantum computers so now i'll i'll give you those students who have some idea who have received some idea about quantum computers and who wish to study or explore quantum computers there are different options available so there are different companies who are doing researches or who are supporting students in this area of quantum computing research so every one maybe google or ibm everyone is doing research in the area of quantum computing so the first one is ibm so ibm uh, has taken some initiative to make this quantum computing as accessible to scientists engineers or students so ibm has launched some to the public it's the cloud based ibm q experience it's an open open source q kit platform so you can make use of this platform and you can explore what is quantum computing so the next is done by dvi system it's actually a company it works on the particular quantum type i have given the names of three types of quantum it works on the particular type of quantum called the annular architecture so this d wave leap it's uh, it's, a, it's it will allow a candidate to sign in and access the quantum cloud for a minute so the the peculiarity is that this quantum cloud is connected to 2000 qubits so each month you you will be able to directly access this quantum or you will be able to work in something called this quantum computers so it's it's really good experience so you can just google and find out what is this dvi system what are they providing then regative forest is another platform it's actually an sdk it's very light you can just download it and you can incorporate it in your uh, in your system itself it's a it's a quantum virtual machine so you know the concept of virtual machine right you can you can download it and you can install it and you can uh, use it in your local machine itself so these are only some of the examples i have given you for those students who are interested in quantum computing then i'll i'll give you one more thing it's like you know about qnu labs right so it's also a company which is doing research about the quantum computing they are in tie up with our university and we are providing students some uh, research facilities in the area called the quantum computing or we are teaching students something related to the quantum computing now what will be the future of quantum computing so once the quantum computers are there or once this com concept comes into the line light everything or every area will have the improvement including the medicine or management or every area even the entertainment industry everyone will have the improvement it just not the computers which is going to replace the actual computers which you are using so these quantum computers or these systems uh, which use the method or which use the concept called the quantum computing is meant for these uh, toughest jobs or meant to do the toughest jobs or uh, those jobs which are difficult for this computers which we are using so it's not going to replace these computers we are using it's it's for the research or it's to do the or it's to manage the whole data 
and one more thing is we we are now using the concept of encryption while we are sending the data or we are using this cryptography concept so once the quantum computing or quantum computers are there it's easy to crack all these codes it's like we are we are working on all those combinations and permutations while we are uh, creating some while we are doing this encryption maybe using some rsa or some algorithm so all these can be break when we have this quantum computers so we have to come up with some quantum resilient algorithms or maybe those which the quantum computers will not be able to crack so the quantum computer once this is there it is expected to be having applications in almost all the areas or wide ranges like artificial intelligence or maybe financial areas or maybe physics even the physics is going to improve because of this quantum computing so this is what is the future of quantum computing